Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see such a, a, a huge turnout here. Um, my name is Hugh Price. Um, I'm in the Faculty of Philosophy and also the Academic Director of CESA. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to um, Jan Tallinn, who's one of the co-founders of CESA. We're very lucky that in addition to our speaker, who Jan is going to introduce, we have Jan with us here today. Um, so, without further ado, Jan Tallinn. Good evening. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker. Uh, Maura Shanahan is a professor of uh, cognitive robotics at uh, Imperial College of London. Uh, and although, although his research also spans computational neurodynamics, uh, cognition and consciousness, philosophy of mind, uh, logic, dynamical systems, and artificial intelligence. His work has been cited nearly 4,000 times uh, in these various disciplines. He's also on the editorial boards of Frontiers in Neurorobotics and Connection Science. He has authored four books, including an upcoming uh, scientific treatment of the technological singularity to be released later uh, by MIT Press, later this year by MIT Press. And recently, uh, he was a uh, scientific advisor for Alex Garland's uh, podcasted movie, Ex Machina. Professor Shanahan, Shanahan is uh, one of a growing number of leading thinkers in AI and related fields who are thinking carefully about the uh, long-term implications of AI technology, both its potential and risks. He was the first prominent uh, AI expert on the advisory board of the Cambridge Center for the Studies of Potential Risk, uh, and therefore played a key role uh, in raising the visibility of these uh, issues uh, and the center uh, in the AI community, AI research community. Recently, he was on the scientific organizing committee of the landmark conference uh, on the future of artificial intelligence in health that was held in Puerto Rico earlier this year. This conference, as you might have heard, resulted in an open letter calling for research aimed at making robust and beneficial development in artificial intelligence. And a sizable grant, uh, or a sizable grants program that was funded by Elon Musk. Last but not least, Professor Shanahan is Cambridge alumnus. Uh, he has a PhD in computer science from King's College. So without further ado, Professor Shanahan. Thank you very much. So thank you all very much for coming along, and I'm very sorry to the people who are standing uh, at the back. Um, I hope that uh, I hope it's worth it. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to uh, so the really sort of four little subtopics I'm going to try and, and, and cover in, in this lecture. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the current level of hype we're seeing uh, both in the media and in industry about artificial in intelligence, and try and distinguish a little bit between the hype and, and the reality. And that's also important for us to set, put in context the, the whole question of AI risk and whether there's anything to worry about with artificial intelligence. Um, then I'm going to talk about the topic of artificial general intelligence. So I want to um, uh, emphasize the kind of AI that might come about in the future, which would actually give rise to, to certain concerns. And I want to talk about the extent to which we're approaching that kind of AI and some of the obstacles to, to getting there and, and, and maybe give some flavor of how far away it is in, in time. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the possible risks that some authors have uh, drawn attention to if we do manage to create human-level artificial general intelligence. If we do manage to create this kind of AI, then, uh, then certain authors have, have drawn attention to some concerns. So I'm going to talk about those, the concerns that those authors have, and the, uh, particularly, particularly Nick Bostrom and Eliezer Yukowski, and, um, uh, and I want to sort of uh, point, uh, summarize their arguments, as it were. And then finally, I'm going to talk about one approach to mitigating the kind of cons risks, the kinds of worries that those authors have, which is basically to make artificial intelligence not only 
human level, if we are able to do that at some time in the future, but also human-like, uh, because many of their concerns stem from the fact that they uh, uh, think that the kind of AI we would create would be human-level, but not human-like. Okay, so that's sort of the outline of things. Uh, okay, so first of all, the hype. So we're in the, I'm sure, the reason why this room is full, right? Uh, the reason why this room is full is because we're in the middle of a period of AI uh, hype, of hype, hyping of, uh, of, of, of AI research. For example, uh, about a year ago, uh, a year and a, just over a year ago, we heard that Google had acquired the London-based AI company DeepMind for, for 400 uh, million pounds, which is a large sum of money. Um, and Google also bought, around about the same time, a little bit earlier, uh, six robotics companies, including uh, Boston Dynamics, who uh, uh, built these amazing walking robots that maybe you've seen some, 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 some videos of. Should we perhaps have the lights now to see the slides a bit? Uh, that's better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, amazing videos of this new ro ro spot robot from Dy Boston Dynamics. And at the same time, Facebook and Baidu have been hiring uh, AI gurus and, uh, uh, and paying them lots of money and so on. And then we've had AI uh, in the media a good deal. And we've had these pronouncements by very prominent people <coughs> such as Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. I'm afraid the quality, that's the trouble with shifting away from my Mac, where the quality of these pictures would have been beautiful. Um, but now they've degraded considerably, uh, I'm afraid. But OK, they are lovely pictures uh, in the original version of Steve, Stephen Hawking. So, so, yeah, so Stephen Hawking um, uh, said that success in creating AI uh, would be the biggest event in human history. And unfortunately, it might also be the last, unless we learn how to avoid the risks. And Elon Musk said, I hope we're not just the biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. Unfortunately, that is increasingly probable. And just so I can gauge the audience, how many people here know what he means by a bootloader? Good. <laughs> Good. That is great. OK. Um, right. And also, we've seen a lot of AI in the movies, of course. And uh, a fantastic film, Ex Machina, that you should all go and see. Uh, OK. I Full disclosure, I was involved in the making of it to some extent, and some uh, other films about AI uh, that have been, been very recent. So it's very much in the public uh, eye at the moment. But what, what's the reality? What, um, what's the reality? So what are the real achievements that we've got in, in artificial intelligence? Well, um, in 1997, the current or the then uh, world chess champion, Garry Kasparov, was defeated by uh, Deep uh, Deep Blue, and many people saw that as a major landmark in, in, uh, in AI research. In, in AI research, and it certainly was a terrific achievement. And Deep Blue was very good, basically at searching through a very, very large number of possibilities, an enormous tree of possibilities of possible moves, um, uh, and searching uh, through this huge tree of possibilities for, 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 for good moves. That's you know basically the way all these things uh, work. But it's a very, very uh, narrow domain, the domain of, of chess. And then much more recently, it also happens to be an IBM uh, achievement. Uh, in 2011, IBM's Watson um, system beat the reigning champion at this US uh, quiz game, Jeopardy. And I would like to point out that the game Jeopardy has an exclamation mark after it. I'm, I'm not uh, prone to, uh, to, 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 to the juvenile habit of putting exclamation marks after it. Uh, so uh, so, so the, uh, that's why that's there. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, Watson has a, is a, it is another terrifically impressive uh, achievement, uh, natural language understanding, and of um, sifting through in enormous uh, databases of, of knowledge uh, expressed in, in natural language in order to be able to answer these often quite cryptic uh, questions that come up in the, in, the, in the quiz show. So that's also a very impressive, uh, very impressive uh, achievement. And what about the kinds of things, so, so little sort of historical achievements, what about the kind of thing that is the state of the art right now and the kind of thing that is actually getting industry excited? Well, there are things like uh, personal assistance. So many of us have tried out uh, or, or maybe even use Apple's Siri or Google Now or Microsoft's Cortana. And, uh, and I think these are actually very, very impressive bits of, of, of technology. 
So they these days have excellent speech recognition capabilities and uh, a, a certain degree of natural language understanding. Of course, they have access to encyclopedic knowledge thanks to the thanks to the internet. Um, they can also use uh, uh, access personal information on your device, so they can uh, answer questions that pertain to you in particular. Um, and, and so they. These little personal assistants are extremely impressive bits of technology, and they're only going to improve. So if perhaps they seem like a little bit of a novelty at the moment, something that, that, that is fun to try out for a bit, but you're not terribly impressed, I think that as time goes by, you're going to become increasingly impressed by these, these uh, uh, kinds of personal assistants. So that's going to have an impact, I think, um, before too long. Just one example of, of, of real AI technology that's going to have an impact in, in, in the not too distant future. Another very prominent example is self-driving cars. So uh, we know that, Go uh, that Google has been working on self-driving cars for some time. They have a, a, a cars that can drive around California uh, without any kind of intervention from the human driver, without having any uh, accidents unless an idiot goes into the back of them. Um, uh, and, and that's a technology that is undoubtedly um, on the on the way, so we will be we will all be going around in self-driving cars before uh, too too long, I think. Um, and there are many other applications of uh, the kind of machine learning technology that underpins the speech recognition capabilities of things like Siri. So the very same kind of techniques and computational power can be brought to bear on so-called big data to help corporations uh, gather all kinds of information about us to do. Um, uh, to do nice things like, uh, well, supposedly nice things like um, uh, work out exactly what our preferences might be for products we might want to buy, uh, and perhaps uh, perhaps uh, uh, states can do less nice things, and, uh, but maybe some things they have to do to catch criminals and terrorists and so on. So there's many applications of big data and machine learning that I think we're going to see impacting uh, the economy and society in the not too distant future. Um, so all of that kind of thing is very impressive, so that's all very clever, but it, in the context of the sorts of things that Elon Musk were talk, was talking about and Stephen Hawking was talking about, where they're imagining this human level AI in the future, well those kinds of things are clever but not that clever actually. <clears throat> And in particular, deep, I mean this is a, 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 an example that I love to use, deep blue can't make breakfast. Deep Blue is the computer that could beat Gary Kasparov at chess. So it could beat Gary Kasparov at chess, but it couldn't make, uh, uh, make breakfast, it couldn't hold a decent conversation, or change a light bulb, or indeed write a computer program, um, or teach a child how to speak, or any, any of those sorts of things. So there's an enormous number of things that any human, uh, uh, normal, healthy human being can do from a very young age um, that, uh, that none of these state-of-the-art AI programs are capable of doing. So Deep Blue and, or, and any other state-of-the-art AI, <laughs> state AI system, none of them can learn in particular to carry out completely new tasks. Um, and I apologize to the speaker, is this still going to be a valid fire exit? Huh. <laughs> Do you need us to move over the other side? Does that work? It's just like when it's burning, you go out first. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I will announce the fire, okay, and then tell these guys to go out first. Uh, okay, so in. in uh, Sorry, if anyone else comes in, just tell them they can't come in. Too many teeth. We lock the door, but that might be unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, um, so, 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 so no state-of-the-art AI program possesses the kind of general intelligence that human beings have and enable us, in particular, to learn completely new tasks. And that's an absolutely vital thing. So in order to do that, you would require what people often now term artificial general intelligence. And there's a very big difference between the kind of specialist AI technology that we were talking, been, I've been talking about with those examples of chess, um, Siri and self-driving cars and artificial general intelligence, which is the kind of thing that gives rise to certain concerns. <coughs> so what's missing? Okay. Well, what's missing? I love this. Larson cartoons are compulsory in any kind of decent <laughs> So this is such a great Larson cartoon. Early experiments in transportation, right? It illustrates everything that matters. <laughs> <laughs> so general intelligence 
is, is adaptive. And, uh, and in particular, we learn through explore, exploration, through coming up with ideas, trying stuff out, creative new stuff. Great idea, right? You know, uh, let's try that one out. And it requires creativity, creativity, sort of, uh, uh, you know, the ceaseless tendency to try out new things. These guys are doing great. Um, but it also requires common sense, which I think we can, which is what these guys are lacking, which is uh, we can characterize as the ability to predict the consequences of actions, um, physical actions um, uh, on, on, on objects in the real world, and also on the consequences of our actions, including things like speech acts and so on, on other people. So the social consequences of actions as well. So uh, again, a, just a small child can straight away, you know, might find this funny because they can straight away see what's going to happen here, right? We can imagine in horrible detail precisely what's going to happen to this guy. Um, so uh, so there's, these things are missing. We do not really know yet how to endow computers with common sense in this, uh, in this sense, um, or, or creativity, and I think they're the, the main uh, sort of uh, uh, the main obstacles to doing to doing this. So, okay, so if we have the ambition of doing that, of going beyond these little bits of specialist AI technology, then how might we do that? Well, there are different approaches. Different approaches that AI scientists have been uh, trying out for uh, for for years, in fact, uh, and will continue to try out, and that may come to fruition at some point in the future. And we can broadly distinguish between two categories of approach. So one is to try and engineer AI completely from scratch. So the analogy is with powered flight. So it turned out that it wasn't a great idea to try and build uh, powered flights to enable people to fly by bu building things that, with flapping wings. So imitating nature when it came to flight was not didn't work out too well. But maybe, uh, but but. Uh, so, so instead we sort of engineered it from scratch, we engineered power flight from scratch with different principles, fixed wings, some means of forward propulsion and so on. So by analogy that might be the way to try and, and, and get human level AI, maybe there's some way of engineering it from scratch, so some people pursue that school. But then another approach is to try to copy nature, because uh, we do know that uh, one way to achieve human level AI is with brains. Brains by definition, have human level artificial intelligence. So that was, or have human level intelligence, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, some kind of Freudian, weird Freudian slip there. Um, so, uh, so, so of course, copying nature is, is uh, you know, is an approach to try and copy the brain, simulate the brain in some reasonably, uh, you know, close level of detail. Or of course, we could do a bit of both. So we, there might be some kind of hybrid approach. So there are these two approaches to doing things. So I just want to be clear that there are, there are different approaches, and those are the two broadest categories. But I also want to be very clear about the time scale and uncertainty. So, so this, is the, this is a little diagram that illustrates the time scale and uncertainty. So I think we can say with near certainty, or with very, very high level of confidence, that over the next 10 years, the current, um, the, the current wave of progress in artificial intelligence, in specialist AI technology, is going to have a significant impact on the economy and on society. And I gave some examples, self-driving cars, personal assistance, the use of big data in corporations for marketing, um, all kinds, in all kinds of areas. So I think that's pretty likely. But there we're talking about this kind of specialist <coughs> technology. So whatever issues come up with, with uh, uh, I thought it was quite a good point. Um, <laughs> so, so whatever issues come up, um, whatever issues come up um, uh, um, with, with, with that, they're confined to this sort of specialist technology. So we're not talking about these big kind of existential worries that might arise that, 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 that were alluded to by Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. So let's look about, let's think about that human level AI, the, the really big goal. So, so if we think a little bit further forward, what if we think about sort of um, 20, 30 years away, well then I think we can say that human level AI by that time is possible, but I think it's still unlikely. Now some people like Ray Kurzweil think that by 2040, well in fact human level AI they think is earlier than that, by 2045 they think it will be everywhere, human level, uh, he, he thinks it will be everywhere, but I would say that human level AI is sort of possible but unlikely in this, in this period. Of course, the further forward we get during the century, as we get towards the end of the century, I would say that human-level AI 
is becoming increasingly likely, but it's still not certain as we move forward in, forward in time. And this is really important to get this clear, this diagram clear. You know, this is, this is specialist technology. Yes, it's going to have a big impact in, over the next decade or so. Human-level AI, the stuff that maybe gives rise to existential risk, may never happen. It, you know, maybe it'll happen in several decades. Maybe by the end of the century, it's going to be increasingly likely. But you know, but it's all kind of it's all hedged with lots of uncertainty there. Now, I just want to, I just want to, I've had a, had a lot of um, uh, fun talking to the media about all these kinds of issues, and I just want to show you what's. So this is, so oh, this hasn't come out at all. Um, okay, but anyway, this is so. This is what the scientists said versus how the media reports it, right? So, so this is if you tell the media so what that little diagram that I just just showed you, then how it t gets to, get, tends to get reported is, right, it's all the future, right? Never mind details of time scale. It's just the future, one big blob, uh, which is sort of roughly between now and quite soon, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and it, and, the cute, and it's all a mishmash of kind of like stuff that's definitely going to happen, like these Google self-driving cars and uh, autonomous weapons and, and, and lots of terminators, you know, and, 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 and death and, you know, horrible and apocalypse. It's all one big blob. So please, you know, ignore media, any kind of media story that presents things like this. And if we, if I, to the extent that I'm talking about AI risk, it's in the context of this diagram at the top, which is very, which, in which we're being, trying to be cautious about time scale and about uncertainty and being realistic about those things. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so now I want to just talk a little bit about how some people um, think, that, uh, think that this kind of um, human le level AI <coughs> might be achieved. So I want to convey uh, uh, a particular approach to this. So this is, we're looking at the engineering approach. So I distinguish between to engineering, trying to engineer human level AI from scratch and trying to <coughs> copy nature. So I'm going to try and convey what some people have in mind as the sort of way, engineering approach and how we might achieve human level AI that way. <coughs> so a lot of it is to do with um, people are very impressed at the moment by uh, results uh, that have uh, achievements in machine learning, and in particular, in particular, so-called deep learning. And deep learning, basically what it involves is uh, neural networks. So this is a, a diagram of an artificial neural network. And each of these blobs is, a, uh, is a, an artificial neuron. Each of these things is a connection. And, there, and information feeds forward from input here to output here. And the input here, in this kind of example I'm looking at here, is, is, is basically an image. So it could be an image. And the output here is going to be a classification of this image tell you whether there is a face there or a cat there. Okay, it's usually just either a face or a cat. Um, <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a joke for the deep learning people here. Um, and, and the reason it's called deep learning is because uh, the, the deep in question pertains to the number of layers um, that you've got in this, uh, in, in this network. And as you move up this, this network, you go from low-level features, so these very, at the bottom here you have low-level features that are learned in a totally unsupervised way. So that means that the, to say that the network just sees a large amount of data and manages to pick out certain statistical regularities there, such as the presence of edges at particular angles and so on, or blobs of a particular uh, type. And, uh, and as we move up this, uh, this network, move up the hierarchy, we get more abstract features. So, that's, so, so it's deep because, of this, uh, because you have multiple uh, layers here. Um, and there have been, there's been a lot of, of, of very impressive work and a lot of success in this field of deep learning uh, recently. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, so that's deep learning. So, so the idea of deep learning is, to, is, in a way, to pick out <laughs> statistical regularities that are present in very large amounts of data, which you, you think about is something that we're very good at doing as well, of course. Okay, so then there's another bit of technology or another bit, another bit of... Um, uh, sort of uh, another AI idea that's very important, which is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, for those who uh, who don't know, is basically the kind of thing that we think of as trial and error learning, which we would see if we were training an animal to do something. Then the animal learns through through trial and error, through trying. If an animal wants to learn how to get peanuts out of a 
uh, out of a, a hanger, then it's going to you know, try various actions, and at some point something will be successful, and it's basically then learned to do that action to get that reward. So reinforcement learning is, is, is basically that kind of learning. It's learning um, uh, basically a mapping from states, the state that it's in, that it get, acquires through its senses, to actions to perform in order to maximize its expected reward over time. So that's reinforcement learning. And the generic architecture is like this. We have an agent, and the agent performs an action which has an influence on the, which affects the environment. And then the environment then is basically telling the agent to, that it's got a certain reward, which might be nothing, might be, can be positive or negative or zero. Mostly it's going to be zero, but eventually you'll get a peanut, you know. Um, that's life, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, and also uh, some sensory information that, it, that tells, uh, tells the agent about the, what the state, the state of, the, of the environment. And so you've got this loop, this reinforcement learning loop, and the idea of reinforcement learning is to, uh, is to basically find a policy, which is a mapping from states to actions that will maximize the expected reward in the, uh, in the future. Okay, so now what we can do, and what DeepMind, what Google DeepMind did, that, uh, that really, uh, uh, or what, or rather, before they were Google DeepMind, what DeepMind did that really impressed uh, Google and, uh, and enabled them to, uh, to, cut, to fork out uh, 400 million uh, pounds uh, was they, uh, they put these two things together in a very, very impressive way to produce uh, a deep reinforcement learning uh, agent. So basically the idea is, so now you know what deep learning is, for those who didn't, didn't know, and the idea is that you embed this, uh, something like this deep learning network inside the, the agent here, and that, and, and then in, inside this reinforcement learning agent, and that, it, that enables the, uh, uh, the, the, this reinforcement learning agent to, to learn a very, very rich um, policies, <coughs> very rich mappings from, from states to possible rewards. So, so you don't need to worry about the details of that. I'll just tell you quickly the example um, uh, application that DeepMind demonstrated, which is with, this, uh, with a, a, a suite of retro Atari games where um, they set their deep reinforcement learning agent going on, this, uh, uh, on, on, on one of these games such as Space Invaders and all the agent knows about is just the pixels and the score. That's the only information that it gets and it plays the game, it plays the game, it plays the game and then the deep learning part is basically learning to find certain statistical regularities, which if you looked into the details, would correspond to the objects like the, the invaders and the mothership and the, and the missiles and things, uh, in, in some way that, well, in some complex way, it would correspond to those things. Um, and it, so it learns to pick out those statistical regularities and then it learns what actions to perform in different states uh, in order to maximize the, its expected reward, which is the score. And the amazing thing is that they showed how you could do that um, and you could give the, uh, uh, this deep reinforcement learning agent a completely new game, just set it going and overnight it will learn how to play that game extremely well, often, uh, often better than the best human players. So that's, that's one very impressive approach um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, artificial intelligence. And now I just want to convince you that that is a, possible, a viable approach to artificial general intelligence. And, and the way to think of it is this, that, that this is an, uh, what you've just seen uh, is an instance of a general, generic kind of architecture which comprises a machine learning component that builds a predictive model of, uh, of the world um, and, uh, and an optimization component that tries to work out how to maximize expected reward over time. So this, I've got this little example from the life of Brian. So who knows what happens next? What happens next? Yes. He falls off the tower and gets caught by a spaceship. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are more people in the audience. There's usually like a of hands go up at that point. So yes, yeah, so he falls off the... So, so the idea is that, um, in fact, what I'm, I'm not imagining my AI uh, knowing that, but, but what I'm imagining in my AI knowing is that, is that what happens next is that this guy's going to fall down, and that if the AI is concerned about uh, death, uh, then it's got to do something to fix the situation. So the optimization component needs to find 
uh, some action to perform that will maximize the expected reward, which in this case means minimizing some negative reward, i.e. the death of a guy we care about, uh, the solution it comes up with is to uh, is to send a spaceship flying in, uh, you know. But then, if you were a super intelligent AI, then maybe that's what you come up with, right? But what I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, is a general architecture, which uh, which um, DeepMind's agent is also an example of. So you've got this predictive component that, that constructs a predictive model of the world, and then you've got an optimization component that is trying to find actions that will maximize expected reward. And some, a lot of people working in AI think that this is, this is a generic architecture that is capable of one day um, uh, re getting all the way to human level AI. And that's the, uh, that's the sort of crucial idea. Well, okay, that's all, that's all very well, but then there are a few little minor, cons minor issues here, um, such as those little missing elements like common sense and creativity and so on. So how is this approach gonna, gonna tackle that? Well, so, you know, common sense here, anticipating the consequences of actions, making sure that the guy on the stone doesn't get squashed, you know, or predicting that he'll get squashed. So that's just a matter of building a good enough predictive model. So the idea is with, with enough, with a truly enormous amount of data um, uh, about the real world, videos and pictures and and, uh, and so on, that, that, that uh, a very, very powerful machine with lots of computation could construct a very, very good predictive model that would have you know, as much common sense or as much predictive cap capability as, as, as a human being. But what about the creativity? Well, again, the idea there is that it's just about throwing enough power and, and uh, computing power at the problem. It's about having a sufficiently powerful optimizer. With a sufficiently powerful optimizer um, uh, and, and the right kind of clever algorithms that you can get creativity to. And uh, as an interesting lesson here is from evolution. If we consider evolution, then evolution is the most brute force kind of search that you can envisage. It just tries out stuff at random, you know, and then selects the things that, 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 that work. But through a truly, truly massive amount of parallelism and truly huge tracts of time, it was capable of inventing hands and eyes and brains and so on. So, so this really, really crude process, given enough power, was able to come up with a kind of creativity. A kind of creativity. So that's, I, I see that as a kind of argument for that it's possible in principle. Of course, you wouldn't want to do it this way. You'd want to you want to uh, employ things like reasoning and, and, and experimentation, all kinds of ways to, to get to, to endow your computer with creativity. You wouldn't do it in this brute force way, but this ev argument for evolution, I think, shows that these guys have a point. It's possible to do it just by throwing a lot of power at the problem. Now, nevertheless, dealing with any of these, uh, uh, these issues in practice you know, could require multiple conceptual conceptual breakthroughs between computer science and AI. And that's why I don't think we know, you know where things are going in the, con in the context of that time scale. We don't know what the time scales are involved in all this. We just don't know what conceptual breakthroughs might be needed. And I have to say that maybe we don't need so many conceptual breakthroughs. We just don't know. Maybe you know, it's enough to throw enough data and enough computing power and there's some crude way uh, of, of, of achieving human level AI that way. I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I suspect not, but I wouldn't rule it out completely. Okay, so, so now I want to move on to the next, uh, uh, the next topic, which is, which is suppose that we succeed in do building human level AI this way. And just to emphasize, we're talking about decades and decades away. Suppose that we succeed, then some authors have uh, uh, you know, and, and people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking uh, and my colleagues at CESA are concerned with um, the possibility that it would give rise to some very nasty scenarios. And I want to try and convey to you the reasoning behind those concerns. Now, at this point, I'm supposed to put up a picture of the Terminator, right? Or so, you know, this is what you normally see at this point. And I am so, so fed up with seeing pictures of Terminator in the media, whenever this issue comes up. So instead, I'm going to give you some Disney and, and the Clangers. I hope there are some Clangers fans here. So uh, because they, these are two examples that do illustrate the same uh, kind of point. So in particular, Nick Bostrom and Eliezer Yukowski have cautioned us to be 
to beware of um, what Nick calls pervert, or, yeah, perverse instantiations uh, of very powerful optimizers. So remember, this approach to human-level AI is to build a very powerful optimization process that can basically find actions to maximize expected reward over time. And, um, uh, and the kind of concerns that they, that they have are to do with, uh, all to do with, or can be summarized in the phrase, be careful what you wish for. And I think the best example um, to illustrate this uh, uh, for people who haven't encountered it before is the Midas touch. So there's a story of King Midas that you're all very familiar with, where King Midas well, he wished that everything he touched would turn to gold. And uh, so, uh, uh, so in, in the realm of a fairy story, thanks to magic, uh, these things can come true. So indeed it became true and everything King Midas uh, touched then turned to gold including his wife and his food and you know and so on and so on. So we all know the story and he pretty soon realized that uh, that his wish was was not properly thought through. Now that that story illustrates perfectly the concerns of uh, of uh, people who are worried about this kind of AI. The concern is that you build a very very powerful uh, uh, AI that works through this, through extremely powerful optimization processes, and you don't specify the goal that you have in mind sufficiently to rule out these kinds of perverse instantiations. And you get all kinds of un or unintended consequences that you weren't expecting. Now, um, so of course this is illustrated by you know also the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, you know the uh, um, the the Sorcerer's Apprentice and wants to uh, have all his water fetched you know, by, by magic. So he uses his, uh, his master's books to figure out this way of doing it by magic, but of course it just brings thousands and thousands of buckets of water and, they, and he doesn't know how to stop it. And so, so it's another example of being, ca be careful what you wish for. But the Midas touch thing is a better example because it's quite close to the, to, to the real concerns uh, there. Uh, the Clangers thing, this is a great episode of the Clangers because it anticipates 3D printing, but we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so basically, um, so, 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 so according, but now according to uh, Nick Bostrom and, uh, and Eliezer Yukowski, this the possibility of these perverse instantiations where you didn't think through quite what the consequences would be of the way you specified your goal, and then you set loose a super powerful, very intelligent optimizing process to, 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 to achieve that goal, um, it's not just a nuisance, it's not just that you, know, you end up with some inconvenient situation and that you've got to go and fix, um, uh, but it's rather it's an existential threat. It's something that, uh, um, uh, what's Nick's exact phrase, that an existential threat is something that threatens to basically eliminate or permanently curtail human potential. And um, uh, so why, why would it be more than just a nuisance, but an existential threat? Uh, so then, to, so, so his argument is very complex. And, and when, when mainstream AI researchers dismiss this kind of worry, they're typically not familiar with the details of his argument. And they should familiarize themselves with the details of Nick's argument before I think they reject it. So one of the elements of his argument um, uh, is to do with what he calls convergent instrumental goals. So the idea here is that any sufficiently powerful uh, uh, AI, AI systems, if we've achieved human level AI, um, is going to have a, have a certain number of goals. You, you'll find that, find that whatever its overarching goal, there are going to be certain sub-goals that are in common. There are these convergent, so they're instrumental goals that are there to help it achieve its main goal, whatever that is. And, um, uh, uh, and, and but any you know AI is going to try and do that. So two examples of self-preservation. So so any AI, in order to achieve whatever goal it's been set, is going to have to ensure its own <coughs> self-preservation. It's going to have to try and protect itself, according to this argument. Another one is resource acquisition. So in order to uh, in order to uh, fulfill the goal that it's been set, it's going to want to acquire as many resources as possible. Um, and th the reason why this is uh, this kind of thing is a danger is because and this is my way of putting it is because in the in the context of this kind of AI we're envisaging, human level AI, <laughs> the intellectual compass of this artificial general intelligence 
includes everything in our world. So all the things that we could manipulate in order to achieve our goals, it can manipulate and reason about and think about. So, uh, so it's not just confined to a chessboard. It, it can, uh, it can, you know, it can try and uh, get the people it wants elected. It can buy companies. It can develop technology. Anything that we can imagine doing to achieve our goals then is in, within the intellectual compass of these things we're imagining, right? So that's why it's a danger. If, if it, all it was doing was just playing chess and was and it's and it's uh, and all it knew about was the world of the chessboard, then it wouldn't be an issue, right? Um, okay. So uh, so the point is, and that this is a uh, this combination is a is a potentially dangerous one. And in particular, if the age if this uh, AGI is super intelligent, so if it's actually more intelligent than than a, than a human, so if it's beyond human level AI, then there's a particular concern here. And uh, again, Nick Bostrom's, part of Nick Bostrom's argument is that he's very concerned with self-improving AI. So if you build, an, I mean, there are many ways that you could go from human level AI to super intelligent AI. I think the most conservative way is simply to speed things up. If you speed up, uh, if you, once you've moved um, uh, intelligence onto a, onto a non-biological substrate, a digital substrate, then you can speed it up straight away, pr pretty much. And that, that, without actually doing anything else, gives you something that uh, is potentially, uh, uh, potentially you know, super intelligent. But he also talks about the possibility of self-improving AI, so AI, AI that can re rewrite its own source code, make itself better, and then there's the possibility of this so-called intelligence explosion that was first characterized by I.J. Good, another Cambridge uh, alumnus back in the 1960s, uh, in fact. Okay, now, um, uh, so yes, so let me just tell you about uh, the, the, the about Nick's particular example of the paperclip maximizer. So so um, so he, the, an example that, that he likes to use is say suppose we got some company that is the first to develop um, uh, uh, human level artificial intelligence, and in fact it, it self improves so pretty pretty soon becomes super intelligent AI. And this company just happens to be a company that ma manufactures office products. So it decides that what it wants to do is to, is to maximize its, uh, its, its paperclip production. So it sets the AI to maximize paperclip production. So the first thing the AI does is, is it starts to, to think, well, I want, to, I want to, to have more paperclip manufacturing uh, facilities. So it, it goes out, uh, starts to, to build you know, more and more paperclip making factories. But then it realizes it needs more money to buy, buy you know, more materials and more resources that can build more and more paperclip factories. So it starts to take over companies, and of course it's very, very, very good at doing this because it's a super intelligent, it's a super intelligent thing. So it starts to buy up all of these companies um, uh, and, uh, and, and pretty soon starts rigging elections so that it can get people in power that will help to maximize paperclip production. And, uh, and as Nick puts it, pretty soon you've tiled the earth with paperclip map manufacturing uh, facilities and uh, before long it's moving out as he puts it into the light cone of our uh, of the universe from here just spreading paperclip manufacturing <laughs> facilities throughout the the galaxy right? <laughs> and now this is of course is a frivolous example but it's actually it illustrates a very important point so that's the kind of thing that concerns um, that concerns uh, these authors and now here is one thing that's absolutely uh, crucial uh, to this. So, so Eliezer Yukowski uh, has this one lovely little uh, phrase that he, that he uses. He says, in the context of this, he says, he said, so these imagined AIs, let me again just emphasize we're talking about something that's imagined and is many, many years off and may never happen and so on. But these imagined AIs, so he says, the AI neither hates you, you know, nor does it love you, but you're made out of atoms that it can use for something else. And the point here, the point here is that is, is that in the science fiction imagination, um, the reason the, uh, the these AIs like the Terminator is 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 is, is, or, or is is dangerous is because it's kind of malicious and nasty and, and horrible. It's like uh, it's like kind of somebody you don't like, but worse, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, but 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 the point here is that that is absolutely the wrong way to think about this. So these things on these imagined things, if you build it in this way, you build a very powerful optimization process, it's not malicious, it's just doing its thing extremely effectively, extremely effectively. So the point here is that it's a great mistake to anthropomorphize the artificial intelligence. So human, and so this is the thing, human level AI 
is not necessarily human-like AI. And this is the, this is the, the crucial point that they make. <coughs> okay, so now I just want to just take a little moment there to, for you to, to, to absorb all of that, because now I want to move on to, 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 talking, to, to talking about sort of my views on this, all right? So you haven't had any of my views so far, so I, I, get, I, need, I, I get my five minutes at the end, right? Okay, so now, a thought that immediately comes to mind to, to many people uh, when, when uh, uh, presented with this kind of argument is to think, well, the, well, of course, any child can straight away understand the Midas touch story, you know, uh, or, uh, or why, and, and, and can understand that this paperclip maximizer is being silly, right? Any child can understand that. And any, so any child can understand that, you know, the genie in the story who grants three wishes and doesn't give the, uh, you know, and the protagonist finds out that, they, that they, they're getting their three wishes in some way that they never would have dreamed was, was they were going to get. Any child understands that that's, you know, that that's a, a, a bad idea, right? So the question that comes to mind is that how could, if we're thinking about a super intelligent AI, how could something so smart as a super intelligent uh, AGI be so stupid, be more stupid than a child, right? <coughs> and the answer is that the kind of AI that we are imagining here, all it does is ruthlessly maximize its expected reward, right? It's just, it, so of course it, it can, uh, in some sense, understand uh, understand, you know, the human needs that are being violated by by just tiling the earth with paperclip manufacturing facilities and killing all humans. It, there's some, it's, it's not that it's not capable of of understanding that because it might need that understanding in order to take over the world, right? So it can, it can but but that's beside the point because all it can do is just ruthlessly maximise expected reward. That's just it's all it does. So here's. One other way that we're all, so people are interested in how can we mitigate this kind of AI risk thinking into the future. And so one way that I want to think about is, well, what if we deliberately set out to make our AI human-like? So, so the bostrom yukowski point is that it's a mistake to anthropomorphize this kind of artificial intelligence. But suppose that we set out to deliberately build AI for which it is not a mistake to anthropomorphize it because we've deliberately made it human-like with a view to making, giving it the understanding that a child has which ensures that it wouldn't, um, do, wouldn't build a paperclip maximizer in that kind of way. Okay, so now I want to talk about human-like AI. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Yukowski and Bostrom say, you know, we shouldn't think about AI as human-like. And of course they're right if you build it in a certain way, but I now want to think about deliberately building it in a way where it's right to anthropomorphize it. So it's kind of hard to pin down exactly why it is that that the human child is doesn't have the same kind of problem as this super powerful optimizing process that we've that we've imagined. And um, and I've been thinking of trying trying to pin this down. And um, uh, and so, so, so I thought this is a good point to wheel on a German philosopher beginning with H, right? So, and, um, so Husserl. And of course, if you're going to talk about German philosophers who begin with H, then it's good to have a title that starts with the word on, right? <laughs> okay, so, on having, so, so, um, so Husserl introduces this no notion of a, uh, a life world, a Lebensraum. And according to Husserl, um, so this is the ground of, of, of intersubjective experience. So it's the kind of, it's the the very backdrop against which human values make sense and against which uh, lived experience is meaningful. So so you, so the point is that human values only have meaning at all, you know, against the backdrop of a given a given life world. So to undermine a person's life world is to is to you know really re render meaningless all their values and goals and utilities. So, uh, so you know, an example might be of of, of some indigenous uh, tribe where you just lift them out of the uh, the rainforest and drop them in New York and just and give them a credit card. You know, you it's it, it's it's not going to go well, and it's not just it's not just because they couldn't learn how to deal with that world. It's because you've taken away the very ground uh, for for the meaning for their for their life. Now, to 
why is it inconceivable? Why can we understand straight away that, it, that, that we don't want to build paperclip maximizers, like in Boston's example? Because we straight away understand that to, dis to destroy or to radically dis disfigure your life, that your own life world, is a, you know, it's the most extreme act we can think of. It's more extreme than, uh, than, than suicide, in fact. It's, uh, it just renders everything, uh, everything completely meaningless. So could we build our AGI to have a life world in that kind of, in that kind of sense? So I, I, I think um, is Sean going to start pestering me about time. Okay. So I want to think about I want to think about um, I want to think about how we might endow uh, an AI with a life world and make it more human-like in that way, so that so that so that you know the idea of you know, destroying the world in order to achieve some, in order to optimize some goal is just completely unthinkable. Completely unthinkable. And um, and I think there are certain there are certain we need to understand, you know, what the very basis of human and biological intelligence is in order to in order to do that. <coughs> so the first thing is I think we want to distinguish between optimization, which is the basis of the kind of architecture that, that these guys have been talking about. And homeostasis, which is a, which is uh, which is kind of uh, different. So homeostasis, uh, as as I'm uh, I'm sure you you all know, is is all about trying to maintain certain variables within an acceptable range. So using a sort of feedback-based process. So for example, you want to make well, you, you uh, an animal wants to make sure that its blood sugar level is maintained within certain bounds and in order to do that it, uh, it needs to pee sometimes and it needs to eat sometimes and it, in order to keep things within a within the right uh, within the right kind of bound so now so the question is what's the right way to understand an animal for example a cat so we might indeed characterize an animal's behavior in terms of maximizing expected reward so indeed you know my cat Sometimes he's going around looking for food and trying to maximize the expected reward by going out into the garden and looking for mice or whatever. And uh, so, so we can indeed characterize what it's doing as a kind of an optimization process that's trying to maximize expected reward. But that's one way to think about it. Uh, and alternatively, we can think of an animal as a complex dynamical system that is trying to maintain homeostasis. And for those of you who um, are familiar with this kind of literature, you'll know that by homeostasis, I'm also embracing the concept of allostasis as well. So sometimes it, you have to take a step back and you have to, have to do more complex things in order to in, maintain these variables within their acceptable bounds. But the idea is that, is that, uh, is that it's a different kind of thing. You're not trying to optimize uh, uh, some, or you're not trying to maximize expected reward by accumulating more and more resources, for example, but rather you're trying to just maintain balance. <coughs> now, very important point is that each of these ways of describing uh, an agent or an animal in terms of optimization or in terms of homeostasis, there's a sense in which, formally speaking, you could intertranslate between those two descriptions. So each description is kind of a limiting case of the other. So we can characterize homeostasis as a kind of optimization process. We can characterize optimization as a kind of uh, homeostasis uh, process. Sure, okay, so that's, so let's, let's take that point for granted. But I think that uh, thinking of th things in terms of homeostasis, that uh, is, is important for thinking of things in terms of this life, of having a life world. So having something, so, so, the, so the animal um, you know, basically has certain kinds of, uh, of habits and behaviors that just try and keep certain keep its life on an even keel, and that's the very ground of everything it does. Everything, and um, that's what I'm interested in in in, uh, in you know endowing uh, uh, my my uh, endowing machines and AI with that same kind of ground. Yeah, of course, this is an illustrative point. So here we have Tutti as our cat. You know, and here we see him uh, ruthlessly maximizing his expected reward, right? Well, no, he's not, you know, and he's not doing that much of the time. So, so you know, even if we made Tutti is super powerful, even if we gave him uh, some kind of super powerful whatever, uh, you know, he wouldn't be that bothered about taking over the world, you know, because he'd rather sleep. Um, okay, so... Um, so I think that, that, that having a life world in this sense, so having something that is 
absolutely fundamental ground for all values. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it presupposes a, you know, a lifelike, uh, lifelike existence. And I don't think that a ruthless optimization process, and the word ruthless is important there because I want to, I, I know some of you will be thinking that we can translate between these optimization characterizations and a homeostasis characterization, but it's the kind of ruthless optimizer that Bostrom and Yukowski have in mind that, is, that bothers me. So I don't think this kind of, this kind of ruthless optimizer isn't going to uh, have a lifelike existence, whereas uh, homeostatic process, process can. So while we're doing uh, German philosophers beginning with H, then let's go the whole hog, right? And um, so, so, uh, so, so this is the first step, I think. But then we can then we have to think a little bit more about this idea of of, of having a world, and Heidegger distinguishes between worldlessness being poor in world and being world making. So, so in his example, or a stone has you know just has no world. Uh, a lizard sitting on a or, on a rock basking in the sun kind of has a, a world because it doesn't just sit there; it will respond to to, to things in the environment. Uh, but but it doesn't really have any understanding of its relations to the things, uh, to, to the world around it, whereas humans have a, an understanding of the relations they have with the, with the things uh, around them. So humans comprehend their relations to the world and importantly to, to others. So I'm trying to build up something here, and I'm not going to pretend that I've got final answers here. This is work in progress. Um, so um, uh, so how can we build, it, build this, 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 this kind of life world? So I'm suggesting that it rests on the idea of homeostasis rather than optimization, and that the world that that, that, that is going to form should form the, the very ground for any kind of uh, uh, any kind of values that the that, that our machine might want to uh, optimize is going to be based on uh, having a, a, a life world, and in particular, <coughs> there are certain things that we would like to see in the life world of our. AI that we also find in the, in, in, in the human life world. So there are certain pre prerequisites. And these prerequisites are, for example, things like embodiment, having a body, the capacity to recognize others, and so-called theory of mind, so the ability to reason about the beliefs, desires, and intentions of, of, of other people, and uh, make predictions about what they can do uh, on, on that basis, so which Jane Hill was an was a important contributor to that theory, of course. Um, uh, the ability to form, uh, uh, to, to form this is vital, of course, the ability to form relationships, the ability to communicate, the need to be a part of society, and empathy. So the idea is, is, that, is that if we build something for which this is the very ground of its, of it, of its existence, this is just what it does, then it would be unthinkable for something that's built that way to just to destroy the world in the same way that it's unthinkable for, for any of us to destroy our world, to, to undermine our own uh, life world, because it's the very ground on which any of these things that we might be optimizing, any of our goals, any of those things, it's the ground on which they make sense at all. So we can't, if we take away that ground, you know, we're not optimizing anything. We've just taken away any, uh, uh, any possibility of optimizing anything. Um, okay, so now how do we do that? So one way to do it, I think I've just got a couple more minutes. Um, whoever's worried about the time. Um, where is Sean? He's disappeared. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so one way to do that is to adopt the, pro the, the, uh, the approach of trying to replicate the human brain. So we, of course we know that the human brain can manage this. So one way to do it is to try and copy the archi basic architecture of the human brain in particular, the way that social intelligence and empathy and so on are realized in the human brain. So that's one approach, uh, one approach to this. Um, so just to, to, to finish off with some of the obvious <laughs> objections to this idea, right? So the obvious object, two obvious objections, I think. The first is that we want to avoid pathology because humans, because we're social creatures and evolution has, has evolved us as social creatures, most of the time we're quite nice to each other, especially if, there's not, if we're not fighting about resources and so on. Um, but we can be very nasty to each other as well. And, and in particular, we want to avoid creating a super intelligent psychopath or sociopath who might turn into a dictator or a tyrant if it's extremely <coughs> powerful in this kind of way. So how do we avoid this? Well, I think we have to avoid, we'd avoid that in the same way 
we would avoid it in, in humans under ideal circumstances. So through an appropriate <coughs> developmental pathway, basically. Um, I'm kind of having to rush a little bit at the end because there's obviously a huge number of questions that this raises. So the second big issue <laughs> is that potentially we're enlarging the moral sphere considerably if we create things like this. Because maybe we're making something that is conscious if we do this. This is a whole can of worms, of course. And then you, know, you have to ask the question, would it have the capacity to suffer and would it therefore you know, to be deserving of rights such as freedom and so on. And, you know, do we want to go there if it, was, if it were possible? That's a very important uh, question. And, and Thomas Metzinger raises some objections to that, to that possibility. Okay, so this is the last slide. I'm sorry I've gone over an hour. I'm really sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is my summary slide. So perhaps the social, economic and political forces that are driving us towards human level, creating human level AI. Perhaps they're unstoppable. I have a feeling they might be unstoppable over the course of this century. And if so, perhaps we have to choose between two perhaps unpalatable uh, alternatives. There's the dangerous one, which is engineering AI that's human level and then superhuman, superhuman level AI, but not human-like, um, based on a powerful, powerful optimization, or the morally challenging option, which is creating AI that is human level and is human like, because it's perhaps based on the blueprint of the human brain, um, but it gives rise to these moral challenges that I just touched on at the end there. Now, m my vote right now is for option two, uh, in the hope, hope that it will lead to some kind of symbiotic, harmonious coexistence with these things that we might bring into being late in this century, if, if perhaps we do, on the grounds that this may be just too dangerous. But then, of course, there's the challenge of stopping people from doing that, even if we do decide that that's the better idea. But that's a whole other issue. So I will stop there and flash up the... Uh, so this is the, uh, my, this is the new uh, book. Um, I hope you like the cover. I was really pleased with the cover. How was I, right? Uh, Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Murray. Now we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, as Murray said, we, we have this tendency to be less nice to each other and we're short of resources and we have to short of both space and time in this case. So I do, I, I do encourage you to be nice both to Murray and to each other. And one aspect of that is to please try to keep your questions brief so that as many people as possible have time to ask questions. Um, so I'll start with, I, I saw your hand at the back first and other people keep your hands up and I'll try to make some kind of a list. But, but you sit right at the back. Um, can I return to, the, um, to your timeline? Oh, which, that's, was, that's a long um, way back. which was where you were saying that you might have to bracket the idea of human-like AI, but the world that we might be entering very soon is this kind of stupid machine-like AI, and make a liberal plea for existential risk, and say that actually what's at stake here is that the stupid machine-like AI is challenging the foundations of the liberal state. Yeah. And that that's what's really important if we accept that possibly human-like AI will never exist. Yeah. That yeah. what we need to do is put in, in place incredibly strong legal instruments now to protect data in order that we don't fall into exactly the problem of never getting to the point at which we get human-like AI, but just get this stupid sovereign who crushes everyone's yeah, yeah, yeah. which destroys the life world. Which yeah, yeah. I, I, I have, I have uh, uh, enormous sympathy with, with, with what you're saying. And, uh, and all, all I can um, say is that it's just not the subject of this particular talk, that's all. So I, here I, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over the, the huge issues r that relate to the social impact of the AI we're developing now. So I'm, I've been glossing over those 10 years and the subject of this talk was the more speculative stuff in the in, in the future. But so so I, I absolutely agree with you. It's you know we need to think hard about the, the the kind of AI that is coming online much sooner and is and is much more of a certainty. And I think we do have to think hard about that too. Yeah. Tim, can we go back to the slide with the cat on it? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> 
when you put up a picture and you said, there she is ruthlessly maximizing her utility, I was like, yeah, that's what cats do. <laughs> and then he said, of course, that's not what's happening. And that confused me. Yes. Because I don't really understand the difference between maximizing utility and just aiming for homeostasis. It's just yeah. homeostasis is, you know, the utility sure. that the cat's after. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. to make well, that really was the, that was the point. intelligent cat with lasers for eyes, the way it will do it is to just fry everyone around it so it can bask in the sun. <laughs> so I, I, I don't yeah. see how this gets rid of the problem, just coding in homeostasis. No, okay, I, I, I agree with you, and that's why um, uh, that's why I, you know, I made this point about each... Uh, um, where is... Where I'm, is I'm here, sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, hi. Uh, that's why I made this point about each, each kind of di type of description being a special case or a limiting case of the other. So I know that this is true, and I... Uh, and I am perfectly happy to grant that this thought needs more work, <laughs> okay, which is a kind of a bit of a cop out. But I do, but I do think that there is some, there is an important difference between the kind of optimization process that, that we've been talking about, the ruthless optimization process, and the, the and uh, what animals do, which is based on, on homeostasis. And I absolutely will grant you that that thought needs further work. Um, you yes, sir. Yeah, um, I, I would be interested in what you meant when, in the end of your talk, you spoke about the social or economical or political forces that yeah. are driving us into uh, the direction of uh, artificial intelligence. And in addition to that, I would be interested whether the biggest risk of artificial intelligence might be the actual form of those forces yes. which drive us. Yeah, sure. So I, 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 so I guess I see those forces as, as, as the forces of, of, of capitalism, basically, and, uh, uh, and, and the fact that, it, that, that in, in, a, in a kind of competitive setting you have in, 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 uh, uh, with, with capitalism, there's an you know, there's enormous incentive to, 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 to produce something before your competitors produce it, and to take risks in order to do that. So if you think that, you, uh, that there's some chance that you can uh, get a decisive advantage over a competitor by building something, then then somebody's going to try and do it. And it's one of those thing, one of those things like a, like you know the leaky bucket. It only takes one hole for all the water to come out. So it only takes one careless actor in this game to uh, uh, to be willing to take the risk uh, in order to to you know expose us all to that risk. So there's going to be there's always going to be the temptation I think in a in, in competitive capitalist societies for people to try and develop uh, risky things. And of course, states can do things to try and try and you know prevent that. But it's but, but then you need we're talking about a global thing, so you will need you really need you know all states to do that. And there's also there's similar forces are, I think coming to play in the military sphere. So in the military sphere, it's not economic forces, but it's the same kind of um, logic is at play where <laughs> you know China is going to say, well, I I need to develop autonomous we weapons, because if I don't do it, you know, then the other guys are going to do it, and the Americans are going to make the same kind of reasoning. So it means that you've got to build these things just in case the other guys do it. And so, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to, to stop this, uh, uh, this sort of um, process. Um, yes. yes. So, um, um, so given what you said about the dangers of very powerful optimizers, um, how strong is the case for discouraging or even banning certain kinds of AI research in, in those areas like reinforcement learning and AGI? Um, so, I, so I think I think currently there's no case for ban for banning that because we just you know we, we, it's, it's just premature to think about these these uh, about you know regulating or banning things right now because we're not there's no evidence that, that we're about to get there. Even so, the deep mind kind of research. Well, I mean, I must admit that it would be, let's, let's forget about DeepMind in particular, but it would be, it, uh, there is some concern about you know, what's going on in the basements of, of companies or, um, uh, or research institutes around the world that we don't, might not know about. So there is some worry that, you know, yeah, hidden in some basement somewhere, somebody is doing something really dangerous. It, I mean, it just seems very unlikely to me, but I agree that it seem, it, it, when we're talking about this kind of existential risk, seeming unlikely is, is, is not a very strong argument. But I, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, ju it just seems to, seems to me premature to want to start banning things on this kind of, kind of basis. 
Okay, I, yes, you had a question. Yeah, so it relates to that point. So, so I'm an AI researcher, I occasionally write optimizers, and I, I'd like to take measures to not wipe out the human race. <laughs> <laughs> so based on this, I, I feel like something I could implement right now, the next optimizer I write, I could just tell it a predefined level, like, you know, it, this is your target, please optimize. But once you get to this point, stop. That's good enough. Yeah. And in that sense, I have a chance of mitigating any unwanted behaviors. Yeah, well, at yeah. some stage, terminates. I can control that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so 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 Nick Nick Bostrom's argue, uh, answer to that argument, which I actually don't, actually doesn't appeal to me hugely, is that is that is that your AI is then going to need to kind of check that it's that it's that it's achieved you know it's 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 ten million paper clips and it's going to you know and it's going to just build more and more resources to just to make sure that it's done it right mm -hmm. and, and so on. Uh, I'm not totally I'm not totally sold on uh, on that as a counter argument but but what i do think is a good counter argument is, is simply the fact that uh that it, it, the argument is not that there won't exist safe optimization processes right the argument is that there only needs to exist one unsafe one right so maybe you know maybe that will work but but the thing is that once you've built something that's this powerful you need to have a way of getting this right every time so you need to have you need to have some deep uh, and, and provable principle for creating such specifications that work, it was guaranteed to work every time, uh, which is the kind of thing that some people you know, are thinking, trying to think about. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think we can, that you can elaborate, we can elaborate on this issue quite a lot. Uh, yeah. um, so I wonder whether we need to think uh, more about the more imminent risks. I think a lot of the points I'm about to make have been made just now, but I'll say them anyway. Imminent risks um, that are sort of independent of whether we call them human level or human like AI. Things like uh, automated high frequency trading algorithms that are certainly superhuman um, because they're much faster than any human. It doesn't make any sense to embody them, and they're in the powers of corporate structures that. You know, I'm, I'm not like an anti-capitalist, but in cor corporate structures are defined to maximize expected reward. Mm. So, I mean, that seems like a very imminent risk, or weaponized um, autonomous drones, for example, yeah, which are yeah. also quite imminent. And so maybe all the discussion of risks uh, should focus on the things that are going to happen soon, yeah. rather than uh, the more murky questions of whether we're achieving human level or human luck. Yeah, sure. Like, okay, uh, which I think are very difficult to sort of pin down. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I mean, I think this is very similar to questions of the one yeah. from the back uh, earlier on. And I completely agree that we need to be thinking about those. And at the risk of antagonising my 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 dear colleagues in Caesar, uh, I've never been totally comfortable with the, with this phrase existential risk. I I would prefer that the remit of, of Caesar or or it was. Uh, uh, was AI risk in, in, in this narrower but more immediate sense as well? I, I, you know, and I'm very much concerned with those 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 issues too. But the counter argument to that is is well, okay, yes, indeed, let's have lots of people thinking about that stuff too. And but 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 this other problem is potentially such a big one, and let's think big and long term um, that we need to devote some resources, some resources within you know. Um, however billion people we are on this planet now, some smart people need to be thinking about this issue now. That's all. Good. Uh, yes. Um, so I'm going to try and challenge, challenge uh, uh, channel Eliezer Yudkowsky, which is always oh, challenging. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that his, uh, yeah, um, I think that um, he, with the approach we're taking, uh, so the approach that, that the, uh, his team at, at MIRI in Berkeley are uh, trying to take broadly centers around the idea of indirect normativity that you, instead of saying optimize this, you kind of say, figure out what we should be optimizing or what we value, figure out, you know, look at humanity, work out what humanity values and optimize that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's a very short sort of, a, of a, a long idea and one that maybe is, is very difficult to realize. But it has the advantage that it's very hard. The idea is that if we try and directly program values into the machine, like make us happy, that it will make us happy at the cost of everything else we value, that it will turn us all into piles of uh, pleasure centers with nothing else yeah. that are just firing all the time, or if we say, you know, entertain us, that it will turn us into things that are easily entertained or something. Yeah. I worry that with the approach that you want to take, the saying, you know, maximize um, uh, Lebensfeld, that exactly the same sort of perverse instantiation will take place. The instantiation is one that maybe freezes us 
here on Earth in the state that we're in today, rather than allows us to take advantage of the sort of potential future that's uh, ahead of us for the, you know, yeah. all the rest of time. Or, or that there's some other, I'm very, <coughs> in general, the approaches which try and directly program in a value, instead of taking a step back and, and program in a, a sort of meta value, seem to me un unlikely to work out well, because yes. when you apply superintelligence to it, you get an extreme yes, unpleasant substantiation. Yes, yes. So, so can I, so, so first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of uh, Miri and the, those people p pursuing that approach to, to us. So I'm not arguing against that that approach. So or coherent extrapolated volition, great. Let them let them look at that as well. But however, I I, I just want to take issue at, the, at, at, at your kind of uh, criticism of this approach because I'm not trying to maximise Lebensfeld, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, and 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 uh, and the point is that you are capable uh, as a uh, of of coming up with this point, right? Mm. And all I'm trying to do is to endow, uh, is to think about how we might endow uh, our AI with the same kind of uh, capacity to criticize things from the standpoint of a Lebensfeld, which is what you're doing, right? And, uh, and, 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 and admit that you, you, may, you may be able to stand back and try and, and criticize that and, and transcend it and, and, and so on. But, but nevertheless, the fact is that you, you're capable, you, you're not behaving as the stupid superintelligent optimizer when you're making the very point that you're making now. And all I want to do is make something have the same basis for doing that that you and I have. Um, yes, you're at the back. I'm, I'm interested in the middle ground, which is the cybernetic evolution of, of humans. I, I don't tie up the idea of being human particularly with being biological at the risk of being hated by everybody in the room. I think it's a, it, when it's a question of whether we can stop the technology or whether the technology will grow and absorb us. Is there not an opportunity to ground it precisely through embodiment? By re what's your take on the whole cybernetic approach? What happens mm. when we take the technology into us to augment ourselves? Yeah. And how does that change these arguments? Yeah, sure. So that would be very much Ray Kurzweil's, I think, yeah. uh, reply to this whole, whole issue, would be the transhumanist response um, to do exactly that. Um, so, oh, gosh. I mean, I... I, I I mean, these are, I mean, it also relates to this whole question that, that you raised of, of, of maybe we should think through the possibility of transcending our limitations and, 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 and so on. And I mean, this is such a big question. I don't know if I can, <laughs> if I can come up with a pat, a pat response to that. <coughs> Personally, I, I, I don't really consider myself to be a transhumanist in that sense. And, I, and, I, and maybe there's some conservatism in me about preserving human value uh, that, uh, that uh, God, I can't believe I'm hearing myself say this, <laughs> <laughs> on, on camera as well. Is <laughs> rolling? Oh dear. Um, but, 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 at that, but at the same time, you know, at the same time I also um, uh, like the idea of, the, of, of this kind of transcendence, but I think it's probably not for me. And what, so, uh, what percentage uh, of your waking hours do you carry a smartphone on your body? <laughs> uh, funny enough, that was not a good example. Okay, but the average person, right? <laughs> but, sorry? The average person carries the average person, yeah, strapped yeah. to them all the time. Or if you were to ask about a laptop, then most of the time, yeah. <laughs> sure, uh, so of course, yes, of course we're already highly augmented uh, uh, humans, of course, yes. Um, uh, yes. So yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's a really complex the whole kind of you know transhumanism um, uh, approach to this issue is is a, is a very valid and, and very provocative uh, if you take it to its limits very provocative uh, way of thinking and really well worth thinking through. But I just just you know, I just don't think there's time to even start now. Nick, I'm wondering about this picture you painted of future in which we. Uh, helped out by one of the human-like AGIs, mm. um, paragons who apparently are fully empathetic, with lots of common sense, who um, wouldn't, wouldn't never touch the power the baby's cheek. Um, but you know, and, and the super intelligent, I think they might be more dangerous to us than anything else you've talked about, because these creatures are going to start wondering about existential risk, and they're going to realize that one <laughs> existential risk that they're, they're posed to them is, in fact, going to be human beings who are not supposed to be. Sure, sure. And they might develop a program for keeping us under control. <laughs> and it comes back to a serious point, which I've argued with, with Martin and Hugh before now, which I think the existential risk to human beings is our human beings. We ought to be thinking much more seriously about you know, issues like religion and, and uh, crusading 
uh, uh, and the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and or even people who have more benign motivations, but nonetheless actually don't know what they're doing. Yeah, sure. Well, of, well, of, of course, that's outside the scope of my talk. For you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what's not outside the scope of my talk was, I think, the point that you, I think, you think was frivolous, but I, I think was a, is actually a, a serious one. That indeed the proposal I'm making, and we have to be willing to, to, to think through. To think, I, I, you know, are, that's why I keep on saying this thing with, you know, I'm imagining something that's 100 years away or, or, and so on. So, so it might seem silly, but I still think I want, but I still want to think, think through it. So I think that, so your first objection, I think is a very good objection. I think uh, if we wanted to throw out into the, into the intellectual conversation about this stuff, these kinds of ideas, then you know, hopefully we've got many decades to think through those kinds of, kinds of possibilities. And I, as I, you know, I did raise the prospect of the sociopath and, 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 and the psychopath and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I, you know, I feel I'm just touching on this and not, uh, and, and, you know, if we knew all the answers, then Elon Musk wouldn't have needed to provide 10 million dollars. <coughs> um, so uh, uh, I think it's a very valid objection. So although you were slightly mocking it, I think, uh, I think it's actually something that we need to talk about. Nick, Nick's point reminded me of a nice line I heard from uh, the psychologist Alison Gottlieb recently. Uh, Alison said that what bothered her wasn't artificial intelligence so much as natural stupidity. That's <laughs> 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 something we have to worry about ourselves. Okay, um, back to my cue. You're the next. Um, can we go to your last slide, please? My last slide. Might take a while. <laughs> I just wanted to. Ask. The last slide is the one with the, with my books on it. Oh, excellent! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that, thank you for that. <laughs> just before that. <laughs> it seems like you're presenting two alternatives: one dangerous and one which is perhaps less dangerous. But is anyone actually trying to build paperclip optimizers, or is it actually just a bit difficult to encode those human level values in uh, prospective AI, which may lead us to paperclip optimizers? Yeah, well, obviously nobody is, is, will, will ever be interested in building uh, paperclip uh, maximizers because that was just a thought experiment and there's a frivolous example in order to illustrate a, 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 a point. Uh, right? Why is that an alternative? Sorry? Why is that an alternative? Why is this an alternative? Yes. Uh, because because it might have been uh, that uh, paperclip maximizers are a frivolous example, but we can imagine a more realistic examples where you set your... Uh, 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 your AI the task of, of you know, of, regi of eliminating poverty or disease and, uh, and it has all kinds of unexpected unpleasant consequences. The paperclip maximizer is a good example because it's very simple to explain of course but in, in, if you want to think about more realistic examples you'd have to go through into all kinds of details and so on. So I mean it's just a thought experiment. Um, but but uh, but going back to the other aspect of what you're saying, of course, of course, this is again. I want to emphasise that this is way. In the field. Nobody knows how to build anything, any kind of optimization process that is that powerful. Yeah, we have we really you know, just have no idea. So it's only if that were possible in the future, and then the concern is suppose we set it to work on certain on certain goals that seem laudable goals and aims, like uh, you know curing cancer or something. That if you don't specify the the goal uh, well enough that you would have these kinds of very unwelcome, un unexpected consequences. Actually, getting back to the whole, again, I think that it doesn't have to be existential risk. I mean, Nick Bostrom has his arguments that, 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 that make it rather all or nothing, you know, that it's going to be take over the world or, uh, uh, or it's all going to be okay. But I mean, I think there are all kinds of, you know, unintended consequences that could, that could come about. It's not quite the existential risk, but I mean, we can, it doesn't have to be quite that extreme for it to be very bad. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, mine is a sort of 2080 question, if I may. Um, <laughs> on that side, it yeah. seems to me one kind of coexistence is like that, and another kind is like that. And it seems to me that even if under your option two, we're harmoniously coexisting, with uh, super intelligent AGI, uh, the social structure might be rather like that of <coughs> pre revolutionary France, mm. where the AGI is the aristocracy and we're the peasants. Mm. 
Yes, I mean this relates to the, to the earlier question that I think was was, was uh, and uh, yeah, I mean uh, I, I don't you know have a terribly good answer uh, for that really. Except I mean I, I, this is all you know it is all very speculative science. You have to think like a you have to be like, think like a science fiction writer, but taking it seriously as it were. And it's very difficult to reason through these kinds of things. So how we would how we would ensure that things work out in a uh, in a good way, in that kind of respect, that the, the right kind of social structures will be in place. You know, I just don't know. But I just, you know, but it, it just seems to me that it's perhaps less dangerous than this uh, than this option. Although I, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. You know, <laughs> and, um, but it's a it's a good it's a good question. People, are, I think, thinking about this kind of possibility often, you know, allude to the fact that we are very happy to keep pets around as it were and to try and, and we have uh, you know conservation is actually a, a very important uh, you know human human value we want to conserve um, nature and uh, you know many of us and so maybe that's uh, that's the kind of value you would want to be inherited by your mind children sure I'm trying to think of what, why I find the um, idea of the dangerous AI here um, unsatisfactory. I think it's this. It seems to be trying to achieve two things in that argument. Um, if I make a really, really powerful optimizer, and it's such a powerful optimizer that is sort of side effect of what it does, it can go out and subvert markets and rig elections and, uh, you know, to, to, to carry on your, your example. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine how I make an optimization of information technique that's that powerful but can't question what it's trying to optimise. Mm. And that argument seems to be trying to have its cake and eat it. Yeah, and it yeah. seems to be that if, well, I can, if I make an optimiser and I make it so that it can't question its own value function, it's not going to be intelligent enough to read elections. Mm. Yeah, but if well, I do make something that's intelligent, then it must also be able to question its own value function. Well, I, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's true. So it, it might be able to... It might be able to question its own, uh, uh, or it might be able to interrogate its own internal processes, and uh, uh, and, and uh, it might be able to think about how to improve the way that it achieves, uh, it, you know, it, it, it maximizes its, its its utility function. But but um, but but you know that, that that whole thing about being able to kind of question, ask those kinds of questions, I think is is a is a is is the very kind of thing that I I want to make it human like I want to make human like AI in order to make that that possible. And I don't I think if you just build things using this kind of architecture, it's not going to be able to do that. Yeah. And this I, is where that that's I see, agree with, with the fact that the, with, with your say so the, the second possibility here seems much more uh, much more realistic and interesting. Um, but my, my my point is that the, the to use again this example of the paper to optimizer. There's just something not right. That argument. But but you see that I think that that is the anthropomorphizing the AI. And you're you're imagining that the AI is like us, where we would you know we naturally think, what the hell am I doing this for? You know, what do I care about paper clips anyway? You know, of course we we think like that. But but the thing that you have built, um, whilst it might you know it, it can still have uh, be be smart enough to build all kinds of fancy technology to rig elections to understand human behaviour in exquisite detail. But it's not. It just wouldn't do that. It just it's just not constructed that way. Um, uh, you know that that's the that's that's the that's the argument. And to think that it must be capable or, or must must you know must do this thing of interrogating its own reward function in that kind of way is is to anthropomorphize it. Evolution never you know, interrogated its own. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Evolution never interrogated, I uh, doubted about its goals, but it, it was like, very powerful to come up with all sorts of stuff. Well, actually, maybe that's not true. <laughs> because we are. Yeah. Well, we are not. No, we are, but there's still, we are, though. It's interesting. interesting yeah, I mean, so the very, the very possibility of, trans, of transhumanism suggests that maybe evolution uh, does eventually start to uh, uh, question its own. Um, Look, I, I'm, 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 I'm afraid we're, um, we're over time. Uh, I apologize. I, there's several people I still have on the list here, and people are still raising hands. So I apologize to people who haven't got their question in. Please do come and join us for a, a drink outside, and that'll be an opportunity to talk to Mary.
Um, to close, let me say that, personally speaking, I found the most disturbing part of your talk, Murray, the, the suggestion that in order to deal with this problem, we're going to have to understand the philosophy of German philosophy. <laughs> 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 On that somber note, let's uh, let's thank Murray for